Tinsley. Thank you. Open your Bibles this evening to the book of Genesis. And yeah, that's toward the beginning of the Bible. See you between now and Thanksgiving. Wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Hope you can find something to be thankful for. Try to keep your TV off this week and the news, and you might enjoy the week. Amen. You might enjoy, or you might just go ahead and die sitting there watching it. Wouldn't you hate to die watching the news? I'd hate to get to heaven and find out I wasted that last minutes of my life watching something stupid as that. Amen. I hadn't said one yet. I'm still talking about the news <laughs> right now. I'll get to that in a minute. Amen. All right. Genesis chapter 19. I thought that I would preach this message this morning, but the Lord gave me to change direction, so I preached the message this morning. This morning that I thought I'd preach tonight. We're going to read a little bit tonight, Genesis 19, then we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 22 and read some. And then I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes. I'm, we're going to look at two different stories. Uh, this in the early portion of the Bible. You have, you have two distinct illustrations, Lot and um, Abraham. And I believe, I believe, according to the Bible, that both of them right now are in heaven. And their success or failure here on earth is, that's all in the past, they're in heaven. I believe they were both saved by faith according to God's word. But their lives here on earth were complete contrast. But you'd be surprised tonight how many Christians are content to live like Lot. You say, no, me, preacher, I, th I read the things Lot did. I'd never do what Lot did. But I want, to, I want to show you tonight that just as much as an extreme contrast of what Lot did and how wicked the Bible said he vexed his righteous soul, he said day by day with the, with the wicked people of Sodom, seeing and hearing the things that were going on. You understand Lot was not a missionary to Sodom. He chose to be in Sodom. God didn't put him in Sodom. He chose to be in Sodom. God didn't make him go to Sodom. He chose to go to Sodom. He wasn't in Sodom against his will. He was there willingly. He wanted to be there. I don't know how much he liked it there. I don't think a child of God likes the filth of the world. I don't think they enjoy the filth of the world, but I'll tell you what, too many of God's people do. We endure the wickedness of the world. We get used to it. We kind of just look the other way. You know, just kind of just because we don't we, we don't want to leave it behind. We just we we just want to kind of separate ourselves from it just a little bit because we know it isn't right. And Lot, you can't tell me that Lot, when the the angels of the Lord, when the angels of God came into Sodom, they said we're going to spend the night out here in the street, and they the angels of God said no, no way, you can't do that. They knew, Lot, Lot knew that Sodom was a wicked city. He knew they couldn't stay in, out in there. He knew it was a vile city. He, those men, those wicked, perverted men, young and old, came, said, send those angels out that we might know them. Lot opposed them only because he had to. Otherwise, he just looked the other way. And they got angry with him. They said, are you going to be a judge over us? For, what a, can you imagine Lot, a child of God, 
First time ever being accused of being a judge. If you ain't never been accused of being judgmental as a Christian, you're not doing right. Oh, this, listen, as God's people, we ought to hear at least once a, a week. What do you think you are, a judge? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the righteous, holy God lives within us. And we live in a wicked world. And we're to judge righteous judgment. We're to judge against the wickedness of the world. You say, I don't believe that. Well, the Bible says, what, know you not that you'll judge the world? May as well get used to it. We're going to judge the world someday. And so we see that here in this story. But I want you to see here just for a contrast. And I want us to ask the question tonight, am I Lot or am I Abraham? You say, well, I could never be Abraham. He was a friend of God. Really? Why did God put him in the Bible as an example? Why did God put Abraham in the Bible as the first primary example of a man who separated himself from the world and walked with God? Why does God talk about being the children of Abraham? You say, well, I'm not a child of Abraham. If you live according to the faith of Abraham, you're a child of Abraham. That's, just the, that's what Jesus said, not what I say. I pretty much stick with Jesus, not, not dispensationalist or Zionist or anybody else. I prefer Jesus over all the rest of them. Amen? I take him over all the independent Baptists and Nazarenes and Pentecostals and everybody else. I stick with Jesus, and Jesus uh, said that, that he told those Jews, he said, you're of your father the devil. He said, if you were of Abraham, he said, you'd be like Abraham. You'd, you'd know me. You'd love me. Well, I know him and I love him. Amen. Amen. And, and, and we, we are, we're Abraham's children. Amen. And we ought to reflect Abraham. But far too often, as God's people, the vast majority of Christianity today doesn't reflect Abraham. It reflects Lot. And let's look at that tonight. It's a sad thing. It bothers me. This message troubles me. The Bible says that the angel said in Verse number 12, the men said unto Lot of Genesis 19, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in, this, in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, and the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, Lot, get up. Can you imagine? They had to wake him up. He was so much of a stupor that they had to wake him up. He couldn't wake up for this, this thing. He believed that God was going to destroy the city, but they couldn't get him stirred up. Yep. I just see him pilfering around the house. Yep. Well, I'll be here in a minute. And the angel said, hey, hurry, man, hurry. The Bible says that when the morning arose, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise. Take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. You see that? Being consumed in the iniquity of the city. And verse 16 says, I wouldn't believe it if I didn't read it in the Bible, but it says, while he lingered. Hold on a minute. I gotta find, my, I gotta find something. And he's in there messing around. While he lingered, the men laid hold upon him upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters the Lord being merciful unto him God in his mercy had to snatch him out of that you know there's a lot of Christians listen to me a minute there's a lot of Christians attitude about the rapture is the snatching away of God's people the rapture they're saying boy I hope it don't come right now you know I, I, I'm just enjoying this world so much and if you were to deep down pry down into the inner thoughts of most people the idea of the rapture is unsettling to them because they're enjoying this world too much they want, listen, they, they want the economy to be strong. They want to have a good conservative president, somebody in office. They want America to just keep on floating right down the road. And they just want to leave it as it is, the status quo. They don't want to leave. 
They don't even realize that the nation is full of iniquity. They don't even realize the nation is wholly given over to filth. And the nation has rejected God. And likely there is no salvation for the nation. And they don't want to leave. They really don't want to leave. You'd be surprised at how many people, how few people really want to leave this world. Most Christians are content to just stay here. Uh, another day. Uh, don't come back today. I've got plans today. Don't, or not today. Boy, we, we fight that. I honestly believe that before the Lord Jesus returns, the vast majority of saints will be saying, God, please come today. I believe the persecution will get so bad. I believe the things will get so bad that saints won't be wanting to stay here any longer. I believe they'll be saying, even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. God, deliver us. There's nowhere people say, boy, where are we going to go if we don't have America? There's nowhere left to go. You ever hear that statement? That, that was kind of cute back, and that was kind of true back in the 50s and 60s when Reagan said that, and it was a true statement. And, and listen, and there was still some decency in America, but today, friends, sadly, America has departed from the living God. We don't. There's nowhere in this world to go, but we still have this illusion that we think we have somewhere here on earth a safe zone. Yep. But I promise you it won't be long before the revelation comes to us as Christians that this world holds nothing for us except sorrow and heartache. You say, I don't want that day to come. Well, I don't necessarily want to suffer. I don't necessarily want to hurt. I don't want to see my family suffer. But I don't want, nor do I want to be content here on this earth, nor do I want con Christians to continue to think that we're here, that we're, that we're in a safe zone. We're not in a safe zone. We're not. He says, why he lingered, the men laid hold upon him. The Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now I want you to notice this. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said escape for thy life get out of here he said run he said look not behind thee neither stay thou in all the plain he said don't stay in the lowland you see listen that was Lot's problem to begin with he wanted to be in the lowland the people were in the lowland the populace was in the lowland Lot wasn't comfortable in the high country. He wanted to be down in the valley where it was easy. He wanted to be down in the city, in the metropolis. He wanted to be around the people. He didn't want to have to worry. He didn't want to have to scavenge for anything. He didn't want to have to trust God to take care of him like those, like his uh, uh, uncle Abraham up there on the mountaintop. He didn't want to have to worry about the wild beast. He wanted to be where the people were because he in his warped mind thought it was safer with the people than it was where God was. He said, you don't mean, you mean God wasn't down in the plain? You find me anywhere in this book where God dwelled in the plain. God didn't dwell in the valley. God's always on the mountaintop. The only time a Christian goes down in the valley is if he's by, sent by, on a mission from God to fight and there's a, there's a job down there. But the dwelling place of the saint of God is never in the valley. The dwelling place of the saint of God is always on the mountaintop. Listen, hey, God wanted his people not to live in the plains, not to live in the valleys, not to live amongst the people. God didn't want his people to live among the populace. Why? Because if we live among them, we'll be like them. God wants us, he said, literally, physically. It's not just a spiritual separation, but it's a physical separation. He says, come out from among them and be a separate unto me, saith the Lord, and I will be a father unto you. You should be my sons and my daughters. God doesn't intend for his people to dwell among the heathen. Amen. Physically. He said, well, I don't have any other choice. We'll make one. Find one. Better it is. Better it is, the Bible said, to dwell in the wilderness than with a brawling and contentious woman. Yeah. Now, if God would say that, then what do you think God has to say about you and I as his people dwelling a bunch of, um, amongst a bunch of wickedness and a bunch of filth? Get out from among them, God said. Don't dwell with them. He said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain. You hear that? Escape 
to the mountain. That's God's word, not my word. He said, get to the mountain. Lest thou be consumed. What kind of a consumption was he talking about? He was talking about, he said, Lot, he said, most of your life you've already wasted in Sodom. He said, let's start all over now. He said, you got your wife and you got your two daughters. He said, let's start this thing fresh. He said, stay out of the valley, Lot. Get to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Let's not waste the rest of your life dwelling in the valley, dwelling in the cities, dwelling among the people. He said, let's start all over and make your life count for something. Get to the mountain. Look what Lot said. He said, Behold, now thy servant hath... And Lot said, verse number 18, Oh, no. Oh, not so, my Lord. Now, what a contradiction. That word Lord means master. You know how many times you have permission to tell your master no? None. But, you know what? Lot's hypocritical. Now, he's saved, but he's a hypocrite. He said, oh, not, not so, my Lord. People say, in order to be saved, you've got to make him the Lord of your life. There's a lot of Christians that he's not Lord. God wasn't the Lord of Abraham's life. Abraham lorded over his own life. Abraham told God what to do. Look what he said. He said, Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. Now look at this statement. Don't miss it. And I cannot escape to the mountain. God, he said, God, I can't obey that command. He said, let some evil take me and I die. Think about this for a minute. Can you imagine telling God, God, I can't obey you. I might die. God, I can't go where you want me to go. God, I can't be obedient. I might die. Boy, you, did y'all you know you're in danger tonight? You shouldn't be here. You might die. You say, well, but I think God, thank God wanted me to be here. Yeah, but you better not obey God. Hey, it's dangerous ground to obey God. Hey, and that's false. That's not true. It's dangerous not to obey God. I'd rather, I'd rather, listen, I'd rather trust God. I'd rather trust God and walk into the den of lions. I'd rather trust God and be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. So what I wouldn't say to God, look, God, I think I know more about it than you do. I got this all figured out, God. I knew how to take care of myself. God, I knew how to protect myself. God, you don't know how to protect me. You're trying to get me killed. You want me to go up there to the mountain, God, and they're going to kill me up there. I got it all figured out, God. Look, I got it all figured out. That's the way most Christians are. We got it all figured out. Verse number 20. He said, now look, God, look here. Behold. Now he said, this city here... He said, it's near to flee into, and it's, it's a little one. He said, look, this ain't like, now look, God, I made a mistake over in Sodom. That's a big city, metropolis. He said, but now this one here, he said, this is a little city. He said, I'll be all right there. He said, you understand? He said, now look, we're going to, we're going to make it improve. Most Christians don't want to revolutionize their life. They just want to improve their life. Can I tell you that God was trying to give Lot a chance here? He was trying to give him an opportunity to revolutionize his life. He was trying to give him an opportunity to start all over. You see, God's, God's perfect will. Listen, your life, God has an eraser. And sometimes we mess up. And Lot was out of the will of God as far as a Christian could possibly be. And God was willing to say, look, Lot, I'm going to erase the thing clean. I'm going to destroy Sodom. You go to the mountain and learn to walk with me. And God, go, Lot, go to the mountain and learn to trust me. Go to the mountain and learn about me. And I'll be a God to you. And you can be my child. You can be my, my you, and your wife. You can be my sons and my daughters. And we can teach these girls to do right. And we can start all over again. Yeah. And Lot said, wait a minute, God. Look, you see over there, there's a little city over there called Zoar. Now, look, if I go up to that mountain, God, you don't know what's going to happen to me up there. How many of you believe that God would ever lead you somewhere he doesn't know what's going to happen to you? God will never lead you in a direction that's in danger. We better quit listening to the world. We better quit listening to the devil. 
We better quit listening to our own conscience. We better listen. Uh, you say, well, you know, my, you know good, good common sense tells me this. Good common sense ain't what God wants us to do. We better listen to what God says to do. We need a generation of Christians who throw caution to the wind and say, I'm going to do what God says to do. Do what God says. We better start listening to God again. He said, this is a little city. He said, it's a little one. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. He said, God, I'm certain I'll be a lot happier there than I would be up in that mountain. I am not a mountain person. God, I, I, look, I hate that. Now that Uncle Abraham, he's fine with that. He's different, but God, not me. I want, I want running water. God, I want to, I mean, I want the city life. I want, I want a nice soft bed. I don't know what's in that mountain. I might have to sleep on the dirt. I'd rather sleep on the dirt than I would to sleep out of the will of God. Amen. I don't know what's up there. God, there's bears up there. I'd rather, listen, I'd rather have to deal with the bears. When we got married, we lived down on the farm there and, uh, we took the old shed and lived there. One day, Jess was walking in the back of the shed and two big black snakes was hanging down over the door, just like this right here. She came running and told me. I said, now look, I said, it's either that or the west side, which one you want? I said, now I'll take you up there and show you. I said, but I think you'll be better off here. I said, I think we'd be better off here dealing with snakes than what we would. And we'd lay there and the mice would run through the roof at nighttime until I got enough glue traps and got rid of all of them. Look here, A. Hey. Brother, God might put you somewhere down in the city. God might put you somewhere for a little while, but it's not the will of God for God's people to live in a wicked, heathen environment. Amen. You say, well, I'm a strong Christian. I can handle it. Okay, Lot. How did it work out for Lot? And he said unto him, See, I've accepted thee concerning this thing also that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. You see, God answered Lot's prayers. God loved Lot, and he, he put up with him. He said, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, meaning little one, little city. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And I want you to know that if Lot had gone to the mountain, his wife would not have looked back. That wouldn't have happened. You say, well, I think it would have happened. No, it wouldn't have happened. That was a direct result of Lot's disobedience. But Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. Where did he go? He got, he, did, where, to, he got up early in the morning to where? To the place. You see, what kind of place was it? Well, it was a place, you tell me. He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Now, you, you, you look, look where Abraham was. Does it seem to be like he might have been at a higher elevation, a higher plain? No doubt about it. Abraham was up on the mountaintop somewhere and he was up above the fray. He was up above all the wickedness that was going on down there. And he was out looking out over at all of it. Why? Because that's where Abraham lived. He lived up above the world. He lived up above the fray. He, didn't, he wasn't interested in living down in the valley with all the filth of the world. He lived where God was. So you mean God wasn't down there? Not on purpose. If God was down there, it's because he had some wayward saint down there and he was trying to get him up on the mountain. Amen. The Bible says that God condescended to men of low estate, meaning that he came down. But listen, it's not the will of God to dwell in the valley. It's that God comes to where we are, but God comes to lift us up to where he is. And God's always above this world. 
The song said, new heights I'm gaining every day. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way. That's the saint's way. That's the Christian way, the upward way. Every time anybody went to Jerusalem, whether whatever direction, it was always up to Jerusalem. Listen, and God is always up above the fray of this world, always. When Jesus went to pray. He went up into the mountain to pray. You see, well, that just figured it right. If something happened once or twice, I would think it was maybe a coincidence. But if you'll read your Bible, you'll find uh, many, 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 many multitudes of times where they went up into the mountain to pray. High above the fray. High above the wickedness. High above the filth of the world. They went up to meet with God. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrows when he overthrew the cities which Lot, in the which Lot dwelt. And the Bible said in verse number 30, And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains and his two daughters with him. Look at this. For he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Now you say, well, now he's up there. Yeah, but that's not what God told him to do. Now he's on his own. You see, the children of Israel were supposed to go up after the defeat at Achan. And they were supposed to go up and fight. And, and God said, go up in the mountain. They said, no, look, we're going to go. And they went up and God said, you're going to get killed if you go up now. You see, when God says come up, you come up. You don't say, well, God, I'm going to stick around here a little while and I'll come up when I'm ready. God says, no, you come up when I say so. Amen. Amen. A lot of people think, I'll just get saved when I'm ready to. Don't, don't rely on that. You better get saved when God beckons, when God calls, when God deals with your heart. You don't know that what you'll have an opportunity tomorrow to get saved. And saint of God, it's the same thing for the child of God. In the life of every Christian, listen to me, in the life of every Christian, there comes a time when God says, hey, come up, come up hither. Come up among the crowd. Don't live down in the world. And you say, but God, I don't want to. I've got my own plans. God, I've got my own career in mind. God, I want to stay down here. I've got a vision. God, let me stay. And God says, okay, go ahead. Have it your way. And the child of God misses the will of God. And they become miserable. And in Zoar, would you believe it? Would you believe it? Lot was afraid there too. He was afraid to obey God. Now he's afraid in Zoar. Let's look at the complete opposite. Let me show you another man. Let's look at Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 22, verse number 1. Genesis 22, 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now listen. Not only did God say to him, Abraham, I want you to take your son and offer him up to me as a sacrifice. He said, he didn't even tell him where. He said, just get to Mount Land of Moriah. He said, there's a mountain there and I'll tell you which one when you get there. You know, most Christians say, well, I'd do the will of God if God would tell me exactly what he wants me to do. If God would just, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm just the kind of person, I just have to know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you something about the will of God. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what God's going to do. Listen, you, if, you, if you yield to the will of God, which you should as a Christian, and just say, God, I'll go where you lead me. I'll do what you want me to do. You better just get ready for a lot of turns and a lot of quick turns. Listen, because God doesn't tell you what he's going to do before it's time to do it. You just say, okay, God. See, now why did he do that? I, look, I'm just going to tell you. You better be ready. When you yield to the will of God, God doesn't give you a book beforehand. 
He doesn't give you a, plan, a yearly planner so you know exactly what's going to happen. You just trust Him. You get in the car and you sit down and you say, okay, God, where are we going? God said, don't worry about it. Okay. You just enjoy the ride. Where He leads me, I will follow. That's the will of God. So, he said, I want you to go to the land of Moriah. He said, one of the mountains, which I tell thee of. And Abraham rose up, look what it says, early in the morning. Now, contrast, Lot was living in a city that was going to be destroyed by fire and brimstone. And he couldn't get up and get out of the city. Now think about that. The angels of God had to slap him around, grab him by the arm, and drag him out of the city, in a city, and he knew and he believed that it was going to be destroyed. But he didn't have enough whatever in him to get up and get out of the city. But here's Abraham. Can you imagine humanly how hard it would be to get up knowing what God had told you to do? But he did it. You know why? Because Abraham trusted God 100%. Abraham believed God. And he said, okay, God. He got up and he did what he's supposed to do. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. Notice that statement, the place. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and... Look at that next word. What is it? Worship. This fake generation today, we're going to worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. You know what the word worship means? It means to bow in obeisance. It means to humble your oneself. Nothing about this. Oh, yeah. Nothing about that nonsense and a bunch of uh, worldly music. That's not worship. Worship is bowing in obeisance before God and saying, God, whatever your will is, I'll do it. Amen. Oh, God. Oh, God, don't tell. I don't. Whatever it is, I'll do it. It's humbling yourself before God and saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I don't like it. I don't like that sound of that. But God, if you say do it, I'll do it. I'll go where he leads me. I'll do what he tells me. I'll obey him. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went both of them, they went both of them together. You know what he was saying to his son? He said, son, just trust God. Now, it was, a, it was a lot easier for Isaac to trust God than it was for Abraham to trust God. Because Isaac didn't know what the plan was. But I, Abraham knew what God's plan was. And he knew what God's word was. But he trusted God. And he said, look, son, God will provide. Yeah. We'll just trust God. Amen. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And he's... The Bible says in verse number 9, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. You say, what was Isaac, what was Abraham thinking right there? You know what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And 
He that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now notice this next verse, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 19. According that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him as a figure. You know what Abraham did? He said, you know what? He said, if God wants me to do this, and I have to take this boy's life according to the command of God, he said, I guess, I believe, I know God's able to raise him up from the dead. You say, you think Abraham was going to go through with it? I know he was. If God didn't stop him, he was going to take that boy's life. Why? Because God said to. See, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense. If God said it, we just need to do what God says and trust in the living God. With this generation, listen, this generation of Christians is starving, is dying for some people who will believe God and trust God. We don't trust God. We trust men over God. We trust the word of men. We trust other things over God. We're fearful. We're afraid of everything everybody else has to say. But we have no fear of God. That's what's killing our churches. That's what's killing our nation. That's what's making Christianity look so frail and emaciated. Is we don't have saints of God who trust God and believe God. And would rather... Do what God says. Then worry and be concerned with what the world has to say. That's the kind of man Abraham was. You say, well, I'm glad God didn't ask me to be like Abraham. Who said God didn't ask us to be like Abraham? We're to have the same faith that Abraham had. We profess to be saved. We trust God to get us to heaven but we ought to trust God in this life and obey God to obey is better than sacrifice obey God they came to the place which God had told him of and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son and The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Where? Where was he? Right where God told him to be. You know, know, listen, if you want to hear from God, you know where you better be? Right where God told him to be. If you want to hear the voice of God in your Christian life, people say, well, I'm saved, but I never hear from God. The reason we never hear from God is because we're not where God wants us to be. As a Christian, there's no greater joy than to hear from God and know God's will. But we're not where God tells us to be. Abraham was right where God told him to be. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know, this is what God said, for now I know that thou fearest God. See, thou hast not withheld thy son." Thine only son for me. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for some people that fear him. He's looking for some people that believe him. He's looking for people that have confidence in him. Listen, we have a generation today, and we live amongst Christianity today that has no confidence in God, no trust in God. We don't think God can take care of us. We don't think God is able. We think God is weak. Listen, the God of heaven that birthed you and I into this world and the God of heaven that gives us hope of salvation is able to take care of our health. He's able to take care of our mind, body, and soul. God knows how to provide for us. God knows our every need. Why can't we trust Him? Why can't we believe that He's able to provide for us? We better get right because times are going to get worse. See, it's just so hard to trust God today. You wait till tomorrow. Things are going to get easier. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You think it's bad now? You just wait. I like to tell you, I like to paint a rosy picture and say that America is going to get better, but America is getting worse and worse and worse and further from the will of God. 
Say, well, it'll all get better when the socialists take over. Have you lost your mind? When socialism has full run, boy, the government will take care of us. Who's going to take care of the government? I'll tell you what will be happening. They'll start euthanizing people, putting people to sleep when they get to be a certain age because you're no longer profitable anymore. That's what socialism does. That's what communism does. Put that one down. Hey, when the little babies are born with some kind of genetic defect, they'll say, put them down. Kill them. We don't want them anymore. They don't contribute to our society. That's what the wicked worldly ideology that teaches this part of this world and you and I as God's people better today separate from this world and and learn to walk with God because it's not going to get better. Amen. So while I'm waiting on utopia, have you lost your mind? Well, I, I tell you what, I, I think I think if we just have a change in pot, I think it's going to get better. Well, it's not going to get better no matter what. Amen. Because this world's rejected the Lord. And we better learn to trust God and trust Him and Listen, if you'll trust God, God will, God will direct you. Amen. He'll tell you to go buy toilet paper before they run out of it. Amen. Uh, I was thinking just a minute ago, and God will tell you, when you had that big flood up your way, Jeremy, you was at work, right? Yep. God told you to go home, didn't he? Right. Got home just in time for your bridge. Otherwise, you've been separated and your family been stuck up the hollow. God said, you know, listen, I'm going to tell you something. God will talk. God will direct his children. Hey, God will let you know things. We just need to learn to trust him and have our ears open and our heart open to God. God is not going to tell you what to do if you don't listen to him. But if you listen to God, God will direct you. He'll guide you. My good friend Tom, who's going on to be with the Lord now, Tom used to call me all the time and he'd say, now, Brooke, preacher, it's, getting, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'd say, Tom, okay. I, I, I believe you, Tom. I said, but I want to tell you something. I said, I also believe this. I said, I, said, I believe God will let me know a little bit too. Yep. I'll tell you something. People have been trying to paint the doomsday picture for a long time. And, and, you, and, and, and here's the thing that bothers me. When I, when I hear these, these uh, uh, commentators and fear mongers and they, they come and they go and people say, well, you know, it didn't happen the way so-and-so said it was going to happen. It didn't happen the way uh, 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 Prisoner Planet said it was going to happen or it didn't happen the way this one said it was going to happen. After a while, people lose confidence and they quit believing. But I'm going to tell you something. When the Bible says it'll be a day's wages to buy a loaf of bread, someday it's going to be a day's wages to buy a loaf of bread. Amen. Now, I don't know if that's going to be tomorrow or not, but God knows. And God said for his people not to be taken unawares, not to let that stuff come up on us like we don't know any better. Now, this world thinks they're going to get better. This world really thinks, they think, you know what? Well, we're going to get this new presidency going on here. We're going to, get, we're going to uh, do this and we're going to get that and we're going to get things right. Don't be deceived. You know the liberal mind, they really think they're going to fix things. But they ain't going to fix it. It's not going to get fixed. But can I tell you, God knows how to provide for you when bread costs a dollar's wages. When we first started the church, gasoline was like a uh, $1.50 a gallon. I, I saw it go to over $4 a gallon, didn't you? You know God provided for us and we was able to manage and get by even when gasoline was $4 a gallon? You know how many diapers we bought through the years? If I were to sit down and figure out all the diapers that we bought, you know God's always provided for them. God always takes care. And God knows the need of His people. All we need to do is trust God. Hey, God has a mighty storehouse. And God lays up for His saints. And God is able to provide for us if we'll just trust Him. God's never taken by surprise. You better get up to the mountain where God tells us, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. It is said to this day, as it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. What? It shall be seen whether or not you trust God or not. Hey, God said, don't you go up to the mountain, Lot. But God, 
You don't, God, you don't know what's in the mountains. God, there's snakes up there and there's spiders up there and there's wild beasts up there. God, look, look, I'm not a mountain boy. I'm a city boy. Let me go down into the valley. God, I want comfort. My wife can't my wife can't stand the mountains. She don't want to go up there. My daughters will lose their minds. God, look, it'd be a lot better if you let us go to Zoar. We can do better there. Okay, God. Okay, Lot. Go on. Really? Yep. I can? Yeah, you can go, go, go. Okay. Didn't work out. There's old Abraham up there on the mountaintop. Man, don't you ever read that about Abraham and desire to have a walk with God like that? The angels, listen, the angels of God came to Abraham to tell him his son was going to be born. And they're getting ready to go to Lot to destroy Lot, the Sodom and Gomorrah. And they say, wait a minute. We better tell him, seeing that he's a lord over his house. He's a mighty man in the earth. And it's like the angels of God said, you know what? We better check in with Abraham before we go destroy that city. Can I tell you something? That Abraham wasn't no angelic creature. He was flesh and blood just like you and I. But he walked with God. And God respected Abraham. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to have insight to my affairs. Do you, you say, preacher, do you believe that God will give us insight into the future, into his affairs? No, do I believe it? I know it. Amen. You walk with God and commune with God. I believe God will let you know what's going on before it happens. Yeah. If you look at the story in the Bible about the father of, of the earthly physical father of, of Jesus, Joseph. The Bible says that he was... He was warned of God not to go to a certain city. But do you know if you'll read that verse carefully, you'll see that before the angel told him not to go, he already knew not to go. Now, he didn't have an internet or a cell phone or anything else, but he had some way, somehow, he already knew it wasn't safe to go there because he knew that king wasn't any good. And he was already warned of God not to go. Flip off the seat head first. <laughs> hey, listen. Can I tell you something? God knows what's going on. It's good to trust the Lord. It's good to have a God in heaven that knows. You know, you'd have told me that in the 20th year of our church that we'd deal with the junk we deal with. I didn't know that. Honestly. I don't think, I don't know anybody that knew all that would take place in the year 2020. I've been listening to a lot of preaching in my life. I ain't never heard anybody say, now listen, this and this is going to happen. Nobody saw it this way, but God did. Nope. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to trust God to take care of me. I'm going to trust God to provide a way. I pray the same prayer I prayed now as I prayed last year. God, open the doors. God, provide. Nope. God, meet our needs. You know what God's done? He's met our needs. We've seen folks leave. We've seen folks go away. But God provides. 